Okay, we're live. We're live. No. <laughs> okay. We're recording. This is a crisis cycling podcast. I'm returning to Ridgefield, where I live, and trying to kind of get closer and closer to home as I talk to people. This is uh, Mark Rappaport, who has a long and extensive history in alternative energies and uh, democratic politics and progressive politics in general. And oh, my glasses are really messed up. But <laughs> I, I'm wondering if you could just uh, tell us about the, yeah, you know, some of what you've done, uh, just kind of a general overview. I know there's quite a bit. So. Well, it's it, it is extensive. Um, I think, you know, the the latest technology I've been working on to try and move it to commercial scale, which is proving impossible, is the geothermal solar thermal hybrid energy system that I invented decades ago. And no, no, before you move forward can you describe the geothermal hydrothermal system and and I know, I know there's a there's a fairly large installation in, in the, that's in Nevada yeah well that's uh, where I propose taking a medium low energy geothermal resource low enthalpy and most of the majority of resources in the geothermal area are not hot enough to directly make power. They did that successfully in uh, the geysers field in Sonoma area, and they've done it very successfully in Southern California in the Imperial Valley. Uh, the Imperial Valley has some of the hottest temperatures um, available, but they also have uh, what's called total dissolved solids. So they found within a couple of years using standard steel pipe, the corrosiveness of the geothermal material completely destroyed the pipes. They so now have to use a, um, uh, a much more expensive metal piping, so titanium you, piping. You're talking about the installation that exists. Installations in yeah, that so are you're, you're, well, that's in California. Okay. The it, it's separate from the installation in Nevada. Now there's but, one. Uh, there are there are, there are quite a number of installations. So, I mean, but can we describe general overview of what your system is? This, the, yeah, that I'm getting to that okay. is it, where that the geothermal that's medium low temperature and can't produce power sits unused and it's the majority of the geothermal uh, in the ground. If you take a solar thermal concentrating parabolic collector, Okay, so you can, that's just basically a big mirror pointed at a concentrated point. At a, at a tube. At a tube. Right, a linear tube. That can raise the temperature over 500 degrees Fahrenheit with a working fluid. Put that through a heat exchanger uh, to the geothermal fluid as it's coming out of the ground before it goes to the power source, then you have a way of making power. Uh, the efficiency is higher with a steam cycle than it is uh, with a natural steam cycle rather than organic Rankine cycle, which uses a low temperature boiling material and uh, runs at about 350 degrees. So um, I, I'm just because uh, I, know I know this is technical. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let me, so basically, you're pulling a, a, a controlled fluid, a fluid that you have underground that's taking heat from the ground. That fluid moves up into this parabolic heater, which is essentially just concentrating Not the sun. Not necessarily directly in. I designed it and it's defined as either direct binary or tertiary oh, okay so but there's I mean, different general you're taking heat from the ground uh, and it, raising it to its a fluid and then raising its temperature with the sun yeah and then you use that uh it's super to turn 500 it, degree make, make steam to run a standard turbine so it, it, 
I mean, the end uh, of this machine is basically almost any turbine you'd see uh, that's using steam. Yeah, it's it runs with standard GE turbines or Siemens or Mitsubishi. Uh, and then when you've done that and extracted that uh, fluid, you can boost that particular fluid temperature as wanted and re important to re-inject that material at uh, some distance from the extraction site, maybe a mile or a mile and a half, and re-inject it in the ground. So you preserve the characteristics of that particular aquifer to function on a long-term basis. Oh, I see. Part of the problem in the geyser field is they used a flashing technology for many, many years, and that depleted the resource, so they lost a over 100 megawatts of geothermal power because of the depletion. Oh, I, you know, I've heard about this just in small home systems where they'll pull the heat out of the well, ground. That's, that's kind of generally... It's a very different system. Yeah, I understand that, but I'm, I guess what I'm getting at is what was amazing to me was learning that you could actually pull heat out of the ground that wasn't replaced you, you know, with your use. Right. And well, that is a ground source heat pump. Yeah. And the new technology and the new designs with the ground source heat pump make that a very efficient mm -hmm. system because it can heat and cool. And uh, even in very cold weather where a standard heat pump stops functioning in the lower 30s because it doesn't function under 34 degrees, you have to have an electric coil for backup. Mm -hmm. The geothermal solar, or rather the geothermal heat pump uses the ground temperature, which is about 50 degrees, 55 degrees, to be an operating temperature. Gotcha. And so it continues, uh, whether it's going to be air conditioning or, or, or heating. And that is designed with uh, the new solid state technology to make the motor drive uh, very efficient. And actually there are some uh, setups uh, in the country where people are running their geothermal heat pumps with photovoltaic cells mm. on their roof of their house or, or supplementing that operation so they nearly come out with zero energy consumption. They can heat, cool, cook uh, with that integrated system. And the emissions, of course, are, are zero. Same with my high energy system uh, that produces power. The emissions are virtually zero. And the, cost, the, the calculation is the offset of one megawatt of a hybrid power plant replaces one ton of CO2 from coal. Wow. And uh, the, the current... Um, commercial scale plant that's running in Nevada uh, called Stillwater is uh, 30 megawatts and I forget exactly it's five years ago maybe six years ago I had met with their chief engineer along with the director of the Department of Energy Geothermal Office and discussed the failing of that system at 30 megawatts in Nevada because they were depleting the resource temperature. Oh, so and this were, is, you were gonna, you're getting back to the mile and a half pipe that moves away. Well, that's that's separate. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Well, it's, it's part of a system, I can't say for so, that system, but they added to the 30 megawatt uh, geothermal plant 15, uh, 17 megawatts of thermal concentrating collector energy and that fixed their problem in fact it raised the overall efficiency mm. uh, several percentage and that cost them seven fifteen million I think it was so but for they 30 did, megawatts they spent uh, they spent a hundred million dollars and the plants failing now there are several years of operation Department of Energy study that I've talked with uh, staff at the Nevada Public Utility Commission, they're really thrilled. Uh, same with the uh, state geologist. Nevada has been identified as sort of the Saudi Arabia of geothermal energy. Yeah. Tremendous amounts of it. Same with uh, Central Oregon, Klamath Falls, Lakeview, 
a number of places in Oregon all have uh, geothermal resources, but they're low temperature. Uh, the best example of being able to utilize the geothermal uh, properly, depending on temperature, is the Oregon Institute Technology Campus. Hmm. Uh, they have uh, the capacity to make electricity, and they circulate the geothermal uh, material, especially in winter, keep the sidewalks melted, the buildings heated, and there's uh, district heating in Klamath Falls. So some people, it's so effective, they keep their windows open in winter because it gets too hot. So I've got you off track. Um, c can you go back to where you were when I interrupted you when you were talking about having to pipe that material, the fluid that has been heated a mile away? You were kind of giving us a description of... Well, that's that's the reinjection method. That's the reinjection method, right? Yeah. So, and this fluid is in a closed system. Completely closed loop. And Correct. then it's just water that you're boiling at the other end, or do you use it's, it? Yeah, it's, wa it's water. It's water. Yeah. Depending, it has certain uh, solids in it, but the lower temperature material has fewer solids, is much less corrosive and toxic. So I was uh, amazed when you showed me this article. I, I, don't, I don't know if we can find it online, but the, the article you showed me, and I thought, why? Why aren't all these systems like this? You know, why don't we have this system? Well, all that over? gets into uh, <clears throat> if you look at the history in the geothermal. So they were going to put these wells, and they have put them in the Imperial Valley. One well can cost $12 million. Mm. And after you drilled it, you're not certain of what you're going to get out. Heat-wise? Fluid-wise, heat-wise. They've been drilling in Eastern Oregon or in Central Oregon. I've got my daughter coming in. What is it, KK? You can you can watch some TV, okay? I just, Daddy, yeah. um, can... <laughs> Hi, KK. Hi. Hi. Quickly, please. Daddy, can, can I be at the Davies because their mom and dad are leaving? Who's there? Bryson. Yeah. You stay home, watch TV. Okay. I let her. I let her go. I let her. Uh, that's, that's my convenient babysitter sometimes. Sure. Um, so in, in Central Oregon, uh, they have been drilling for hot rocks. They haven't had enough water in this subsystem. They have found temperatures, and uh, the Department of Energy Geothermal Office in that's EGS is their shorthand for enhanced geothermal systems, meaning hot rocks. But they've spent tens of millions of dollars because they think they can more effectively re reach uh, more uh, higher temperatures. But when they've been doing it over these last decades, there hasn't been the fluid flow. So. Again, that's a lot of expense that's not recovered. And that's what's happened with a lot of geothermal is if it goes in, it's uh, not a proven well, then you've sunk costs that have no recovery. Gotcha. Where with the lower temperature application, we have uh, databases that are accessible uh, with temperatures and flows like at OIT. And we know then a way to calculate the required additional thermal energy to drive uh, steam turbines of various sizes. So that minimizes and lowers the cost substantially so it can be competitive. But because there's no um, exclusion, even though I hold the patent and it's, it was exclusive for me to me, uh, it's expired, mm. um, and uti given existing utility policy uh, and the way they operate within a public utility commission or public uh, sector, uh, they don't take any risks with new technology. It's why they like the windmills. Uh, big corporations have built the windmills, like the Danes, uh, pioneered that so they know they can and of course Bonneville did this 
over 20 years ago, they would have three megawatt machine and they knew it ran for years. This is what happened up the gorge. So that's not it. And then the tax benefits that accrued in that mm. gave the utilities a safe measure of tax incentives, reliable energy, even though it's running about one third of the capacity. Same with solar, the so, photovoltaic systems. So it sounds like there's just a variety of reasons this system hasn't been adopted. Um, one that I take issue with, I, I understand the tax one because the tax incentives will always be behind the, the technology. But this isn't really new technology. It's, it's almost as if you've just put two old technologies together and we're all standing around going, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> you know, that's what, yeah, well, you got to... That, well, Obvious. You know? <laughs> well, you know, that some things are obvious, unt uh, that they're not obvious until somebody points it out. Yeah, well, I and, agree. And I, I did that in 1972. Yeah. And so that is illustrative of the complacency and the resistance to change in the st structure we have. Uh, in, in energy facilities and policy. Carter tried to do it. I had a multi-million dollar uh, grant award to work with Bonneville Power to do this in the late 70s. And when Ronald Reagan got elected, I lost my funding. Mm. They canceled it. And there were only 10 projects that were identified. And I have learned subsequently, you know, that... Um, being as he's a nuclear engineer, he, he particularly understood the problem, long-term problems. Who's he? Uh, President Carter. Oh. Uh, that he and Rickover both understood the long-term problems of continuing to think that nuclear was going to be a, a, a real solution. Because mm -hmm. it, it holds within it certain characteristics that are very um, troublesome. Mm -hmm. uh, the toxicity, the long... Uh, life of de the decay of the radioactive material is thousands of years it's radioactive and we still haven't come up with a successful technology to keep it safe from human exposure now as we i mean i'm stepping off topic but as we move further into the anthropocene and uh, the destruction of the natural environment and especially as we see our fellow human beings, most of whom have no interest in changing their lifestyles or anything but comfort. Uh, you know, I, I look at, I find myself looking at next generation nuclear, which is using some of that um, spent fuel. Uh, they're building reactors that use the spent fuel and bring that less and less toxicity into that system. I mean, it doesn't erase the toxicity. But when I look at the choices that are reality, I know that I've started to think, and maybe we just have to have nuclear. And no, I disagree. <laughs> okay. But that you got to remember what drives it, and it's the military defense industry. Yeah. Uh, their particular technology. Uh, I mean, I'm familiar with uh, you know nuclear technology on submarines is. Um, been very safe but it took Rick over uh, most of his career and fighting the Defense Department to make sure that they didn't cut corners uh, in the development of that technology. Oh, I can imagine. Mark I gotta stop you for a second and turn that TV. Apologies. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, I mean, we don't need to do, really dig into that argument at this moment, and uh, we're gonna we've got about twenty minutes left. Um, I really was intrigued by your system. I, I, it looks applicable on many different scales, uh, and it's something that I think a you know a small city or a medium sized city could look at just to power itself. Um, well, yeah, that's one of the things that uh, I proved could successfully occur in community scale, which is another reason I opposed large nuclear and nuclear, because it's not necessary. Uh, we just have to make 
the commitment to plan sustainably for those technologies that will not be toxic in the long term. In Medford, Oregon, I pioneered an independent biomass cogeneration power plant. Started at 20 megawatts and it's now 30 megawatts. It's been running for 30 plus years. And it takes woody waste material, orchard debris, yard debris, mill residues, uh, minimal material from forests that uh, people have to bring it. Uh, and, and the community brings in over 80,000 tons of waste wood debris from their backyards instead of burning it uh, to this facility which burns under the uh, PM10 guidelines and has the lowest emissions that, you know, that are required. So with the stream extraction you have a plywood mill and a drying, uh, lumber drying operation, both running from the exhaust steam of the power plant. That's cogeneration. Mm -hmm. The Europeans do this much more regularly. You can use it for district heating, for homes, for factories, business processes. Uh, and we don't think in those terms because the utilities have uh, sold the bill of goods to the Public Utility Commission or have a singular focus. Um, now, I believe Eugene Eweb does provide some process heat from its wood waste plant to the university. That, that is happening. But those are the kinds of things uh, with proper planning and forethought uh, as well as more efficiently designed buildings, uh, we can really uh, accommodate successfully long-term sustainable uh, renewable technologies that are not damaging to the environment. In fact, one of the issues we're going to have to come to grips with is the annual some forest se fire season, catastrophic fire, uh, has been occurring, yeah. and we know for the last several years. Well, this has been something we've tried to address. We, when I say we, I was part of a committee uh, that advised under the Clinton administration with the Forest Service and BLM, um, trying to address the the coming catastrophic fires with climate change. So. The trees get stressed under drought conditions. The beetle, the bugs come in, destroy the fire forests, which then burn hotter. So that creates a plasticine layer on the ground and destroys the uh, mineral, sort of the microculture so of we, soil. We already see this happening. I know uh, uh, firefighters in California who say that they are throwing out the book on how to fight forest fires because they're so much hotter, they're moving so much faster that the old rules don't apply. It's it's a new fire. It's new fire. It's, well, it's, that's it's a catastrophic fire. fire. What has happened, and uh, the Oregon forestry has been proactive and the Northwest uh, Pacific Northwest Forest Service have been that proactive where they have done um, carefully managed selective thinning. Uh, in those forests where they've done that managed thinning, the fires don't go through at a catastrophic fire rate. Mark, does so you're extracting they're sweeping the forest? No, you're not sweeping the forest. You're not sweeping the forest. Sorry. But an illustration would be, um, I know that uh, the Baker City watershed was helicopter logged. Um, I'm trying to think, well, it's just trying to think, maybe 20 years ago when I had talked about putting a biofuels refinery plant in um, Eastern Oregon. They piled this removed material, it was huge. At the same time, they completely accomplished 
mitigating catastrophic fire in the Baker watershed. Hmm. Now, an illustration of when people don't understand what's going on in Denver, about years, a couple of years before that, uh, Denver water people uh, have their water from the Front Range of the Sierra, uh, the mountains. Rocky Mountains. Rocky Mountains, yeah. The, there was a huge protest about their effort to thin the forest, that somehow that was bad. Uh, and, and, and some extremists, uh, environmentalists, said, no, you can't do any of that. Well, sh shortly after those, uh, they backed off of thinning and providing uh, a more natural forest stand, uh, fire went through and completely devastated a substantial part of the Denver watershed, followed by, within a month, uh, heavy rains. Those rains filled the water reservoirs, uh, I think it was upwards of a third with silt, and made the water system kind of undrinkable. Some cascading and uh, So failures. the cascading result of failures yeah. of policy yeah. and people understanding uh, what was at stake. No, no, and no, that's no. illustrative of why what we should do and what's possible with uh, biofuels refineries and the technology we saw. Someone uh, was on 60 Minutes and they have a plant in Moses Lake. Well, he's using a lot of established research technology. He, he didn't, he combined a um, linear accelerator to break up the cellulose uh, material as it went through uh, the feeder, and then it goes into the processing. Um, they were making, from that process, diesel, biodiesel, they showed him dumping a uh, five gallon can of it into his diesel truck. And this is something that he's so, trying to put forward. And let me just keep it in you. Because um, when I gave a talk in uh, Stockholm in 07, the, the conversation was very interesting because I found out from Swedish scientists that they had been recycling wood waste from their forest because they have a lot of it. Uh, and they were gasifying that material and turning it into dimethyl ether, or DME. And Volvo had re retooled some of its heavy eight diesel trucks to be dual fuel, so they can run on diesel and they can run on DME, either one. So if you look at the calculations of what's feasible with this new technology to create transportation fuels from waste biomass, then we have an enormous resource because we're going to have to treat the forests. But if we start treating the forests for forest health and fire mitigation, not just in selective logging, uh, then you're producing a feedstock to a biorefinery that can provide diesel fuel ethanol and jet fuel and there is a study that was done by the Oak Ridge National Laboratories uh, 1.1 billion tons annual wood waste so they were calculating what could be readily resourced and recycled across the United States in communities of woody waste debris uh, 1.1 billion tons and you want to have your listeners do some calculations and scientists that I've talked with feel well right now they can get 60 gallons a ton it could go and they forecast 100 gallons per ton so do 100 gallons per ton times 1.1 billion tons waste while we're creating uh, meaningful jobs saving the environment preserving our soil quality and enhancing the uh, recovery of CO2 by healthy trees. So these, the lack of real 
understanding of the interrelationships of this very complex system is another problem that hasn't been adequately addressed. I can imagine that. Now, I know uh, the, the biochar, so you're talking about taking waste materials and turning it into energy, and I'm, I'm presumably there's some, I know I, I know I simplify, but... But when I, you said biochar, I hadn't oh, said biochar. Sorry. But biochar is another material that's made as part of the process of wood waste, and biochar, once it's made, can be put back into the soil and store carbon that way. So it takes carbon dioxide out of the environment and puts it back into the soil where and it adds And it's an inert the, material, as I recall. Well, it, it contributes to the health of the natural soils. Yeah, so it's it, a natural organic uh, yeah. amendment. So other... Uh, so the, we're talking about two different systems. There's this ge geothermal uh, parabolic yeah, solar very one, different and then there's another system that we we you you designed, or you are part of designing the uh, the um, the biochar is the only thing that's come into my brain. The I, I, well, ether. Well, uh, I didn't design anything with biochar. What I've talked about and what I did with the biomass one plant, we show that there are ways of utilizing at community scale, hmm. waste materials, woody waste materials instead of landfill. But others have been working on technologies and I did uh, meet with people. We couldn't get the funding, those certain universities did, and the Department of Energy did fund at NREL uh, process they call it a PDU, Process Development Unit. And so they have studied the conversion of woody waste into different material, into different fuel feedstocks, and provided funding for um, advanced technology to process those materials, which the fellow at Moses Lake is using. So we're in Ridgefield, uh, I look, I look ahead, and I don't see, uh, especially our culture, but I don't see humanity reacting in time to uh, the, the great existential peril of climate change. And I start thinking, why aren't we, as a community, looking at resilience uh, hyper locally? And how how would how do we, what can we do in terms of the things that you know that will possibly if maybe it's a dream world but affect some change uh, right in right in our city uh, you know is it would it ever be possible for our community which is supposed to expand to almost 30,000 people in the next 20 years to have uh, and, and I think that'll happen I mean, sooner than just to the what can our little community yeah what can we do I mean can we the, produce we can. can we, we have build several a, choices well, just as you and I talked, and I know I've talked with uh, a very well-known local activist, Don Stanky, uh, we talked to the superintendent of the local schools, and we said, gee, why not design the new schools to incorporate solar PV? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, he said, well, the design's too far gone, maybe in the next building. You know, he came up with an excuse. Yeah. of not being proactive and this is something we have because he had a limit in his budget yeah well and I've, and, and I've tried to talk to uh, and mention to the city manager or the mayor or the chair of the port commission you know there are places where the port has land sitting vacant where we could put a photovoltaic array um, I mean I had talk to you and uh, Don about we, we should have our local uh, Clark County utilities who successfully implemented a community photovoltaic arrays uh, continue with that work but I haven't seen them to continue it so we have to have some uh, proactive leadership and we need the proactive leadership uh, to come from the community, the local community, and uh, we can do these things. The, the only thing I've ever seen produce proactive leadership is a proactive constituency. 
I, I, well, that's why you're doing the podcast yeah. too. <laughs> to try and stimulate some people to go. Oh, we can do something. Yeah, we can. We can call. And I know uh, from talking with Sandra Day that she's interested in the uh, biomass. Uh, you know, just she wants to learn about things. I know that she's approachable. I know that she'll listen to uh, discussions. I brought up compost, and she was pretty happy to discuss community yeah, composting. And so, I mean, you have a, you have a willing ear. Yeah. who's willing to learn and I, and I guess I'm just saying that because it's not like if you approach your city councilors they're going to just shut their brains off I mean some will but no, I, there are I've those there that will, that will listen and can be pressured I have not gone down to a city council meeting so and talked about these things I'm trying to finish my book yeah well you know we don't have a whole lot of time so why don't you tell us about your book and uh, well it, it's, it's designed to give the general reader, uh, a better understanding of the choices that are right here in front of us and to ask their representatives, hey, why don't we do something a little differently than we've been doing it? So uh, the community is, uh, people are understanding, you know, these choices aren't going to be um, forced on us, uh, but we have to facilitate the transition. And the change wouldn't be enormous. It's, uh, oops. <laughs> Sorry. That's our that. sign off music. <laughs> um, so there's, uh, you know, that, that's what I'm trying to work on. So that's it, your it, next Show thing people is... what they specifically can do in their household, a number of different things, things they can do with the local utility, things community members can ask the local utility to to do that facilitate um, energy efficiency energy conservation lowering um, the you know the carbon footprint of the community and I did recently acquire um, the European uh, guidelines for creating electric charging infrastructure that they're using in Europe and I've already given it to uh, Steve Stewart oh, and to wonderful. Jeff for the yeah. local. Steve Stewart's our uh, city manager. Our city manager. Okay. So, um, you know, I'm going to reference that in the book. And there are different things that I have these interesting studies. And they're kind of esoteric, but I can adequately refer to them and provide that kind of information and huh. in detail that we can get this whole thing started. So every time, what we have here is an opportunity because we're growing and what we're seeing installed uh, should have the capacity uh, and at least according as I understand they're going to include electric charging stations in these new developments. Oh that'd be wonderful. So I know uh, they're planning on putting one or two downtown as well or at least there's some discussion of that. Uh, putting uh, electric charging station. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I don't know if they're going to but I know that's and, and uh, I know that's been discussed uh, and Steve Stewart uh, he's well aware of the issues we we face and is uh, yeah he really was appreciative of my giving him this uh, document yeah, I mean, it's, it's not yeah. two or three pages it's more like 40 yeah <laughs> well I, I you know thanks for coming up I really appreciate yeah, well, your thanks time for asking I, me, you know I'm just we're just touching on oh I know I know the, the information that's like uh, there's one fellow I, I've known over the years, and he's a pilot. He was a Top Gun instructor. He uh, was dean of aeronautics at Baylor. Great guy, f amazing pilot. He flew an ethanol-fueled plane, not a jet, but a prop plane, fueled 100% on ethanol from the United States to France. Oh, wow. Years ago. Wow, yeah. Yeah, see, that's the thing. When you look is, at this, uh, this is decades and decades old. The, the technologies are old. We, the, we've we known about the problem. In some cases, the you know o overburdening our atmosphere with CO2, we've known was going to happen for over 100 years, and nothing gets done. You know? Well, you got to remember, the fossil fuel industry is enormously powerful. Yeah. And 
the other thing I try to remind people is whose ox is getting gored in this transition of technology. Mm. And it's the fossil fuel yeah. industry. And don't, they have, find... don't they have kids too? <laughs> well, <laughs> don't you have kids? Well, they have kids and grandkids, but uh, <sighs> you can see by some of the uh, lifestyles of the enormously powerful companies and what they give to their CEOs, uh, it completely detaches them from the reality of yeah. what's happening on the ground. Yeah. And rather that, you know, they went to that, they have their Davos conference. Oh my gosh, we're going to run out of time. A, <laughs> you and I can do this for hours. <laughs> yeah, we could. And it's just that one of the examples was this historian who says, you're sitting around talking, it's, excuse me, you've got all this money, you got most of the wealth of the world with all those people at Davos, you got to get taxed. The taxes have to be applied to the proper kinds of solutions. Yep. And uh, I appreciate your letting me give you uh, some information and oh, helping man. me share it. Yeah, uh, when you get uh, a little further along in your book, we'll, we'll do another one. All right. All right. Thanks, Mark. You bet. We really appreciate it. Cool. Uh, I'm not. Yeah. Oh, Mark oh. Rappaport. He's right here in Ridgefield. I'm going to be finding other people I know. In fact, I'm supposed to talk to Scott Hughes, who's running for the port again. He's already a. Uh, he's chair. Oh, is he the chair now? Yeah. Oh, I, okay. I'm, yeah. I'm not. I'm not up to date on the. I mean, there's one thing marvelous things about Ridgefield. It's a small enough community and. The, I've been here long enough. It's easy to know, get to know a few of these people because it's not. That's true. You can meet them at the night out or at the first Saturday. They're all, almost all of them are there. I do have to shut this down because we are running out of memory. And where is that? There it is.